This is the talk that you're in. I hope you, you, you are where you expect to be. Uh, my name is John Schneider. I'm from the engineering tools team and internal te tools team at Netflix. And I'm Taylor Wixell from the billing and payments team at Netflix. Today what we're going to be showing you is how to take a simple canonical Spring Boot web service and turning it into a cloud ready service. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that simple Spring Boot service and we're going to incrementally add cloud ready features, some of which you may have seen before and some I promise you haven't seen before. Uh, we'll start out with adding a service discovery and explaining uh, why you, you want to do that. Uh, we'll add uh, client side load balancing and ribbon. Uh, move over to just a, a little brief bit about Fane, and then uh, the circuit breaker pattern with Hystrix, and we'll, we'll follow up with uh, how we do uh, tag-based metrics collection and reporting and show you how to generate some nice visuals from the Atlas metrics backend towards the end. So every bit of code uh, we're going to show you is already on GitHub. We have an organization we built just for this called Netflix Spring One. If you'd like to follow along, uh, start out with these three sample projects, uh, sample Eureka, sample membership, and sample recommendations. And since the head of all these repositories is the, the final answer, so to speak, you know, with all the pieces integrated, if you do want to follow along in the sample recommendations project, check out the start tag uh, because we'll be, we'll be working exclusively in the recommendations project and adding uh, functionality to that, to that as we go along. Uh, last little bit of uh, admin note here is if you, again, if you do want to follow along, uh, once you call in these repos, go ahead and start Eureka and start membership. Uh, you can do that either from the command line through Gradle W boot run, or if you suck them into an IDE, just run the main method in both. So just to describe the API we're going to be building today, uh, we're going to take the role of the recommendations team at Netflix. So it's going to be a, a very slimmed down example, but the recommendation service is going to make a call to the membership service to fetch some information about a customer. Uh, in our example, we're going to get the age, and we're going to use that data to feed into what kind of recommendations we return. So if we just shift over to the code aspect of this demo, uh, you can see it's a regular old Spring Boot application. We're using the, the one class style. Uh, we're defining a bean of REST template. We're defining one REST endpoint, API recommendations uh, slash user, to which we're gonna respond by calling the membership service, which is running on our local host, port 8000. Uh, we're going to check the age of any given customer that comes in, and we're going to return recommendations based on that. So anyone under 17 gets some kid recommendations Anyone above gets the adult uh, regular catalog. And of course we have some just Lombok here to flesh out the data model. So we're gonna go ahead and start this guy up. Common Spring Boot application, and then we're going to go and look at some of our infrastructure. Make sure that is visible. Yes. So we do have Eureka running. We do have the membership service up, but not recommendations. And we're going to just move on to figuring out how we're going to turn this into the style of application we would build at in Netflix. So we have our business logic. Now we need some of the infrastructure magic. So before we go too much further, uh, we're just going to execute a few REST requests against our, our service that's running that we're going to be operating upon. So if, just to, to demonstrate that it's, that it's up and running. I guess I got to hit the right port. Good start, huh? And sure enough, so our recommendation service is really simple. Uh, since 
the, my service believes that I'm 10 years old. It's going to say that I should watch The Lion King or Frozen. That should be familiar. Uh, Taylor, since it says he's 30 years old, it's going to give him some, a uh, couple different uh, movie recommendations. It's going to say he should watch The Shawshank Redemption or this blockbuster film we've heard about called Spring. Um, so that's it. It's a really simple service. And this is a good point to say that uh, this, I, this could basically be packaged into a war and deployed to Tomcat in a data center you know, on WebSphere or WebLogic or anything like that. So to any organization that's, that's starting there, that's starting in a data center, that's starting you know, uh, you know, on, on kind of legacy platforms like that, this is your starting point. Um, and Netflix wasn't that different. Uh, we're not that old of a company. We just started streaming uh, at all in the, in the mid-2000s. Uh, and we didn't start making a cloud migration until after 2010. Um, so a lot of what you're going to see today is really just uh, things that have really emerged in the last uh, five or so years and, and, and how we've learned from that. Um, and so without further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll do the first thing, which is adding Eureka. Um, if you're following along, we're going to first go to the Gradle script that we've got for the recommendations project. And you'll see this pattern over and over again with, uh, with Spring Cloud. We're going to add a dependency on org.springframework.cloud. Spring Cloud Starter Eureka, a really easy name to remember. And we'll refresh our Gradle dependencies to be sure that, uh, that we get that new dependency. While we're waiting for that, the only property that we need uh, to get the service communicating with Eureka uh, up front is just the location of the Eureka service itself. So we're going to say that the client service URL is here. Notice I've got Eureka running on my own machine. So again, you know, if you're starting, one of the things you're going to notice if you're starting in a data center, or you're starting, you know, not not, you know, in a cloud platform right now, is all the pieces that we have, all the pieces that we're going to show you, can be ran on this laptop and will be ran on this laptop. So they can be ran anywhere. They can be ran in a data center. They can be ran in AWS or GCE, uh, anywhere at all. And for the purpose of a, a demonstration, a little later on here, we're going to add an instance host name too. Um, we'll call it the one, the one and only recommendation service that we're going to be running today. Uh, by default, Spring Cloud will choose the host name as the host name of your machine. Since we're going to be executing some REST requests against Eureka server itself, we want to give it a, a name that's predictable. And internally at Netflix, we usually set this, since we're in Amazon, to the uh, Amazon instance ID. Just anything that's unique, globally identifiable, that represents your one server instance. Lastly, we just add enable Eureka client on the Spring Boot application. So this is the first step in, in uh, making it cloud ready. And because we're not quite ready to show uh, ribbon uh, client side load balancing yet, we're going to add a primary uh, annotation to this REST template so that the existing functionality still works the, when we use a, the REST template to execute a request against our fake membership service then uh, it's still going to execute it using the regular DNS name and not try to use Eureka to do so. So we're going to start up recommendations again. And now when we go over into Spring's lovely uh, Eureka server uh, dashboard here, we see that we have two services running membership and recommendations. And you see that the instance name for the one and only recommendations instance is indeed the one. Uh, so this is, this is the starting point right here. Um, one thing to note, so we started out here, right? We started out with just two services, one executing uh, against another via some fixed DNS name. We do want to point out that this isn't entirely different from an environment like this where 
maybe you're running multiple instances of the membership service and you put them behind some sort of load balancer. If you're an AWS, that would be an elastic load balancer. And then you, you put a Route 53 DNS name on that, that uh, ELB so that it's got a, you know, a fixed name and you execute against that, that Route 53 provided DNS name. This is a pretty common paradigm, I think. This is, a, this is something you'll find in the wild quite a bit. What we've just done is we've taken this and we've eliminated the two pieces in the middle. So uh, we're ready now to add uh, a client-side load balancer that allows the recommendation service to execute requests directly against the, uh, effectively directly against the membership service without having to define additional pieces of infrastructure like load balancers and Route 53 addresses and so forth for every every service that you provide in your, in your microservice architecture. What this also gains us is the ability to plug in additional operational insights right up front. So when we want to go to add a circuit breaker dashboard, that circuit breaker can refer to all the service instances running in your microservice architecture by just querying Eureka server and, and getting all the instances. When you want to uh, run a, a piece of delivery automation, you know, like Asgard or, or, or Spinnaker, which we'll tell you about later. Um, again, that can execute requests against Eureka. When you want to uh, develop a metrics backend that shows you uh, certain statistics about every service that's running uh, in your organization, that can be done, again, uh, versus Eureka. If you're back here in this realm where you had load balancers and things like that that you're configuring once per service, uh, you also have to be able to itemize all those services for every one of these pieces of operational uh, insight that you try to gain. So this is a key benefit of, of service discovery. All right, here. So one of the other items that uh, doesn't get talked about very often when we talk about Eureka is, okay, we have service discovery, we have load balancing, but how do we enable testing and how do we enable rollouts? So Netflix commonly uses a red-black strategy, right? We have code. Uh, running in production, we don't want a downtime. We want to pull up some new code, and we want to make sure that it's reasonably functional. And then we want to disable the old code path, but not actually destroy the servers. Um, in AWS, it can take anywhere from five minutes to 15 minutes to bring up a new instance. So if we find an issue with our code uh, and we need to recover quickly, spinning up new instances isn't going to happen. So what we will typically do is uh, use discovery to affect the, uh, the visibility status of a given instance. So you can see my recommendation service is registered as up in discovery, and I'm going to go ahead and just influence that slightly. So I'm just going to make a curl to the Eureka service, and I'm going to drop this instance, the, the instance ID that is unique, the one out of the recommendations cluster. I'm going to put them out of service. There we go. Anybody using Ribbon or any kind of Eureka-based load balancing would not be able to find this guy. So great, now he's disabled. No traffic will go to him. Um, mission achieved, we have red-black. Well, not quite. I mean, some of our services are REST-based, but on other teams, we have more than just REST-based services. Uh, billing and payments. Everything we do is batch or queue based. So how do you enable red black based on something that's not, not rest centric? So a piece we found missing from Spring Cloud, which we've added, is the, exactly that ability, the ability to react to your discovery status. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that dependency and we'll see how that works for us. So it's going to be under Spring Cloud Netflix Contrib. This is a library we've created just for the purposes of uh, taking some of this internal code we've been using for a while now with Spring Boot and just putting it out into the light of day, sharing it with the community. Uh, I expect fully that this is going to be a temporary location for this code. Every bit of this we really want to put into pull requests for Spring Cloud. Yes. Yeah. No, no more internal wrappers at Netflix that only we know about. We, we commit to sharing what we've learned. <laughs> so. Let's 
just refresh those dependencies, let that come back. And while that's going, I'll go back to our recommendation service. And what we want to do is start actually coding against that event. So easy enough, Spring has event listeners now. Uh, this is a great improvement on, on the uh, Spring application event patterns. Love this annotation. Kudos, guys, and the 4.2 release for having this. So we're just going to code ourselves to a Eureka status changed event. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to print out the result of this. So this event will fire and return to me the current status, not as my, imp, uh, my instance thinks, but as the rest of the world sees it. So if the, if the discovery servers think this instance is down or out of service, that's what's going to be triggered here. So if we just bounce that app. Hopefully we should see, ah, Discovery thinks we are out of service because I bounced it just fast enough that it thinks I didn't actually die and come back as a new instance. I'm the same instance who temporarily lost connection. So let's see if I can just shift that a bit. So let's put him back into up. If I go here, I see the status is up in Discovery and now we're just simply waiting for waiting for this instance to recognize the fact that it is now up. So here we have the hook for it. This is where we're going to put in the, the actual core logic. If you're on a listener container, some JMS container, right? Container.stop. If you're a Spring integration fan, uh, control bus dot send. Stop the channels you're interested in, right? If you are uh, scheduled jobs, you know, find the jobs, disable them, spring batch, kill any, any recurring instances or any running instances. So now, even though you're not just a REST central application, you can participate in red black using discovery. So that's, that's exactly how we do it at Netflix. Our internal tooling, when we say we want a red black deployment, we'll do this. It'll find the instances in the old code base, disable them, put them out of service, bring the new ones up, let those take traffic. If there's any batch stuff running in the background, those will get stopped by this. Excellent. One of the things we love about the way uh, Spring Cloud has implemented the Eureka server integration itself is that it's an annotation that you put on a Spring Boot app, um, which at first blush, you think, well, that's not super useful. Why don't I just download a binary and start the thing? Um, but what's interesting about this is since, since you're, you're decorating a, an existing Spring Boot app, uh, you can start adding functionality <laughs> to Eureka server that doesn't already exist. So we already talked about Eureka server's uh, use in our uh, automated deployment or automated delivery uh, pipelines. Uh, right now, you could take a, you know, enable Eureka server decorated Spring Boot application and start adding endpoints to it uh, tailored to your types of deployment automation. Um, so, you know, you could add a red black endpoint to this that knows how to take an existing set of instances out of discovery and, uh, you know, puts another one in or reverses it if you, you know, if you don't like the results. You could add kind of a basic, a really poor man's form of canary, automated canary analysis to this. So it's a really interesting uh, choice, and I think a wise choice that, that was made uh, on, on how to implement this. Okay, let's not do that. <laughs> so uh, we do want to, since we're going to be jumping, we're going to jump from Eureka now to client-side load balancing. Before we move on to the next subject, uh, are there any questions in the audience uh, thus far about service discovery, why you would use it, et cetera? Yeah. Sure. 
So for Zookeeper, that was actually uh, initially looked at as, as a way to manage discovery. Uh, we just found that it didn't scale extremely well and the stability of it at the time was a little bit questionable. So you know, for 100 instances or 1,000 instances, that may not be a big deal. When it's the tens of thousands of instances, that, that became a, a maintenance issue more than anything else. So that was, that was the, the genesis of discovery, of Eureka, sorry, I should say. We should mention also, uh, along those lines, and I don't think we mentioned this earlier, uh, it should be apparent from this diagram we showed that, uh, that Eureka is a central point of failure here in your, your whole microservice architecture. So it's, it's critical that you don't just have one instance of this running. Uh, for us, uh, we, have, we operate in multiple uh, Amazon regions and in every availability zone within those regions, and we have at least one Eureka server running in every availability zone in every Amazon region that we run in. Um, and since Eureka is designed to be fault tolerant and distributed, um, it's you know, basically we'll, we'll always have a Eureka server that your service can talk to. Hopefully it, it is just upgrading the Spring Boot and Spring Cloud versions. It all depends on how good of a job we do on Spring Cloud, getting those interfaces defined and, and seeing what are common patterns that, that should be cross-cutting uh, across the different discovery mechanisms. So we're showing, responding to status changed events. Um, hopefully that becomes part of a core interface that console will also support and we'll just make that across the board gonna, gonna work so you don't have to worry about it. But that would be the goal, and that's, that's why we like Spring Boot. Netflix isn't likely to move off of Eureka to console. It is very likely to move from Eureka 1 to Eureka 2. So even for us internally, the pain of that we want to make as minimal as possible. And my understanding about our internal migration from V1 to V2 of Eureka is that, uh, you know, uh, V2, the V2 server will report instances that were registered with the V1 server. And so you kind of have a time there where um, you have both versions of the service running and, you know, potentially you have a mixture of clients and you, as you move your way towards V2. Yeah. Yes. Not, not truly because we still do use ELBs um, occasionally. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. He was asking if there, we think there was anything we lost when we took ELBs out of the picture. And Truth be told, there are many instances of, of applications in Netflix that just use an ELB because it's simpler. Uh, they, they don't need a lot of round robin routing discovery stuff. Sometimes we just use Route 53 because we know there's only one or two instances. That tends to be more tools than production applications because once you get to the point where I'm gonna stand up a thousand instances of a thing and do red black, um, we're going to go the Eureka route instead. And to add to that, uh, I mean, to be honest, the there's a historical argument against ELBs that isn't as true today as it once was. Uh, when we were operating in EC2 Classic, it was almost impossible to pri privatize an ELB so that you know, it wasn't exposed to the rest of the world. Um, that's no longer true in VPC, um, but we had already gone down the route of, of client-side load balancing, and we've discovered other benefits to client-side load balancing that I'll show you in just a little bit um, that even today with ELBs and VPC you don't get. Um, so I think we kind of like accidentally fell into it, and now we're happy that we did. Uh, one more. What's your favorite pattern for discovery in the Eureka server? So you scale up Eureka, you add more to the cluster and your availability stuff, and now all of your apps, you don't want to update the application out yet more. No, no, we, we, still use, we still use Route 53, um, and, and internally we have the config to go across each of the, each of the um, Eureka, the Eureka instances, the server instances. So it's just Route 53 to a well-known DNS name and really a handful of them because we have one for each availability zone and for each region. But that stuff's all kind of baked into our, our core deployment. When we push something into an ASG on the base AMI, we have just environment variables that will set those properties for you because they, we know what's the most appropriate Eureka endpoint for you to use. It's the one in your region, in your availability zone. All right. Now, got another. Uh, 
They do, uh, at least the way we run it internally. That, that would be a configurable thing, but we currently do that. Uh, yes, yeah, the data is, is shared. Um, it's not a full replication. Uh, it's it's gonna be partial, so it's gonna be split across in number of nodes, however many you want that replication factor to be. But yeah, we do, we do keep that. And it may be worth noting that data as it stands today is currently all of it shipped to the client in Eureka 1. So Eureka uh, on my local machine knows about the status of all the other instances. That's the big improvement of Eureka 2 is reducing that footprint and being able to subscribe to interested servers instead of just the entire server farm. So definitely look forward to Eureka 2. As soon as it's ready, we'll be rolling that out with Spring Cloud just for that benefit alone. The, uh, yeah, and we've hit, we've hit on a couple points here on Eureka. I mean, it is an eventually consistent distributed system, so um, that has some ramifications. When, when you go to do a, a, a delivery pipeline and you, you want to use something like Red Black Push or, um, or you know, some sort of canary uh, analysis process, um, you, you pretty much have to accept that your old version of the service and the new version of the service are for a time going to be operating simultaneously. And that has some implications for how you develop your services. Those services need to be stateless. Those services need to uh, be able to accept these kind of changes, um, which means your services probably also need to take uh, you know, uh, quicker incremental changes rather than, than massive changes when you go from version to version. Uh, and speaking from the billing and payments team, that's not an easy adoption for everyone to make or wrap your head around using going from a transactional system uh, to a non-relational non non-transactional, eventually consistent model when you're dealing with money, it's not easy. Don't, don't think it is. It won't be a, a simple conversion, but it is worthwhile. It's definitely the right thing. After we've done it, that's, that's the opinion. All right. Well, we're going to move on to uh, load, client-side load balancing. We're going to show you how to integrate Ribbon uh, and, some of the, and some of the pieces about that. But first of all, I do need to satisfy a bet here. Uh, you know, Taylor and I have been, been going back and forth on the, uh, the famous question of the, uh, the brace, whether it should be uh, on the next line or on the prior line. So um, I wish I had something to bribe you with. Um, that's feedback for the conference organizers. Next time we need drink tickets so I can bribe people. But who would like the brace on the same line? That's overwhelming, okay, Taylor. Okay. That's overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I agree, it's objectively better. Um, yeah. So um, the first bit uh, to the to, uh, to ribbing integration is we're just going to remove this, this override that we have on REST template. And we're going to let Spring Cloud do what it does best and auto configure stuff for us behind the scenes, uh, unbeknownst to us. Um, so we're going to remove that REST template, and what we're going to get instead is we're going to get an auto-wired REST template that's already configured to work with, uh, with Eureka. So we can, at this point, we can replace this hard-coded DNS name with a virtual host name uh, that we've set up. So the virtual host name by default is just this application name, and we can refer to it that way. I never knew, I, I always knew PowerPoint was annoying, but I didn't know it would keep showing up between as I was trying to tab between things. It, it really wants to interject itself back into this presentation, and we're just not going to accept that. Um, so yeah, now the, uh, the service is running again. And you see that the result is the same. So now we're no longer using a hard-coded uh, address, we're using a uh, just the virtual host name, and we're able to do that. Um, about, so we, we talked a little bit about the, the benefits of client-side load balancing as opposed to ELBs. And I'm going to give you a couple concrete examples that are already baked into Ribbon open source. Um, so you're, everybody's familiar with like the uh, round robin type strategy or maybe like a, a geolocation type strategy. A few of the other ones uh, uh, Ribbon gives you by default are, there's one called a zone, a zone avoidance rule. So imagine you have nine services of an application running in, in AWS region US East 1, three of them running in availability zone A, three of them running in availability zone B, three of them running in availability zone C. If a client of that service 
keeps executing requests against the three instances that are running in availability zone A, and they keep returning you know, bad results, uh, the load balancer can infer that there's probably something wrong with that availability zone. And so rather than just round robbing over all nine available instances, it can say, I'm gonna start preferring these other two availability zones over here for a while until we see uh, availability zone A start to heal. Um, a second one could be uh, an availability filter rule on your circuit breaker trips. So again, if you have a set of five services, two of which have open circuit breakers right now and they're falling back on their fallbacks, three of which are returning normally, I'm gonna give preferential treatment to those three that are operating normally as opposed to those that are giving me the fallbacks. And the third one would just be that the load balancer can keep track of the response times and give preferential treatment to those instances that respond the most quickly. That seems like a, a, a very common sense thing to do. Um, the, and you know, it's, it's important to note that with, uh, with Ribbon, you can compose these various rules together. So I could have a give preferential treatment to instances with the fastest response times plus uh, add the zone avoidance rule as well. And you can plug in your own, uh, your own load balancing strategies by just implementing the iRule interface and configuring it appropriately. Um, so a lot more flexibility in what you can do uh, in terms of load balancing that you could ever do uh, with just an ELB or Route 53. All right. Um, the last thing we have to, to note about Ribbon, um, and I think this is kind of a, a hidden feature um, that's, not apparent, that's not apparent from the beginning, is whenever you're using Ribbon or whenever you've got a Ribbon-enabled REST template, um, there's already a retry mechanism built in. So if uh, you've got two instances of a service running and one is down and one is up, and your particular uh, client request goes against the one that's down, uh, there's a configurable property to say retry n number of times. And more than likely, depending on what your rule is, the first one's gonna fail, it's gonna try the second instance already for you. So um, that's baked into ribbon. Um, don't only, think in those terms when we get to hystrix. Only later. for gets, mind you. Uh, we don't do that for posts or puts or deletes. That would be a little bit dangerous. Uh, that is an option you can configure if you choose to go that route but it's probably not a great idea. All right. Let's see how we're doing on time and whether or not we want to talk about Bain or not. I say we skip it. Um, Although we should ask, does anyone here use Fain? Yes. Thank okay. you, Spencer. Uh, uh, <laughs> so Fain internally is not used a lot at Netflix. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of support internally, and we're trying to just see if that's appropriate or not. Uh, trying to get a measure of what the community interest is, why you like Fain, why you think we should you know, keep using that. So anyone who raised their hands and, and has an opinion on that, please come up after and tell us. We, we definitely want to know what you like about it, what features it's missing, uh, what kind of support it should continue to get in the future. Since it's so quick to demo, we won't. We won't cut it out for you. The, uh, we're familiar right now with this form of REST template call now, REST template .gift for object, And right now we're using a virtual host name or a VIP address here uh, to, to invoke the other service. Uh, what this would look like with Fane is you would, you would enable Fane clients. So again, same pattern, add a dependency, add an annotation to enable the feature, and then you're off to the races. And uh, we could define a Fane client. And we'll call this membership repository for now. And we'll say that this is against the membership virtual host. And the reason I, that I, I think it doesn't find a lot of adoption uh, any longer at Netflix is because what you see us doing here is configuring more or less the same set of things that we had to configure when we just used REST, or uh, the REST template um, straight up. So 
we uh, Fane will provide a, you know an automagic implementation of membership repository for you, and you could replace this REST template call if I injected you know an instance of uh, a Fane client here with. So that's basically Fane for you. Um, it just kind of adds another layer of abstraction between uh, something calling a service and you know, the, the actual call site. Um, so like Taylor said, it's, uh, this library isn't really uh, maintained by anybody at Netflix anymore, um, but yeah, it's out there, uh, stable. Uh, use it at your discretion. Um, for now, we'll remove this piece and put things back the way they were, all nice and tidy. Any questions about load balancing while we're on the subject of load balancing, client-side load balancing? I think we got them all out of the way with Eureka, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, move on over to Hystrix now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's right. The question was to to get ribbon involved here. You did nothing, uh, and that's that's pretty much true. Um, there's a there's a lot more sophisticated use cases you can imagine. I mean, set that retry policy. Set the you know what methods you accept on uh, on it. Uh, all of you know, that is configuration. You yeah. can drive that through properties files or some external configuration management system. So the code does not change from the, the example we started with right from the beginning, base business logic and nothing else, spring boot, everything you should already know. We're gonna make very, very few, if any, changes to turn this into what it looks like internally at Netflix. So we're moving on to the next piece here, which is, uh, which is Hystrix. Now Hystrix, I'm gonna start resolving dependencies over here and then we're gonna show a quick picture of the canonical example of Hystrix usage that they like to tell to newcomers to the Netflix uh, ecosystem. So we, when you see this, when you log into Netflix's home screen, you see a list of list of movies, you call it. So it's a Lolomo, um, if you can pronounce that. And uh, the Lolomo is provided it is personalized for you. So we watch your viewing history and you know your demographics and stuff like that. And we, we try to present a, uh, a list of uh, titles that we believe that you wanna see. Um, if for some reason, so there's a, a Hystrix circuit breaker around retrieving your personalized uh, recommendations for a particular row. And if that circuit breaker trips for whatever reason, we can't retrieve your personal results, we're gonna fall you back on a set of of you know, commonly you know, popular movies that, that we think, oh, there's, there's a shot that they'll watch one of these. Um, and so that's, I think that's the, the, the example you can keep in mind when you think of, of Hystrix and whether it's appropriate to use or not in your case. Um, when you think of something like a payment system, there's not really a, really a great fallback to getting paid. Um, so you know, Hystrix isn't appropriate everywhere, um, but there's certainly uses for it, uh, many good uses for it. So to, to recap, we added the dependency over here. And we will, you could just about guess it, right? We're gonna enable Hystrix, and to be fair, you could say enable circuit breaker. Thank you, thank you Spencer or Dave for being so abstract uh, in your treatment of this. Um, but hey, we're Netflixers, we're gonna say enable Hystrix, why not? Um, and, at this point, we're gonna, we're gonna start by adding a, a, a decent fallback. So a fallback for a set of movies recommended to you by age, uh, maybe. It's gotta have the same signature, by the way, as the original method. Might be just a set of movies that are like family recommendations, good for all ages. 
So we're going to say like movies like The Sandlot. Everybody loves that one, right? And Hook. You know, that's safe for all ages. And we're going to return that set of movies as our fallback. And here, up in our request mapping, we're going to add a Hystrix command itself. And we're going to say, So this would be it. This would be the, 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 the basic, you know, as simple as it can get Hystrix command uh, configuration right here. Um, you're, you're just specifying a fallback. Um, and whenever any exception is thrown from this, this uh, implementation right here, um, it's going to go back to the fallback. Uh, so in our case, if we're not able to find the user, we're going to go to the fallback. If we're, you know, the, the membership service was down, we're going to go to the fallback. Um, we're going to add one more thing here, um, which is, uh, I think, very commonly found uh, when we use Hystrix internally at Netflix. And that's the, here, let's put this up here. Because I cheat, you know? It's shameless, but, but I cheat. And that's just a timeout. So we're going to say that whenever the implementation of this method takes more than a certain amount of time, we're going to just go to the fallback. Um, so we're going to say, if it takes more than five seconds for you to find a member, forget it. I'm just going to give you the family recommendations and move on along. Um, this is an important thing, because when you have a, a, a string of microservice calls, one to another, uh, and there's some service that's, that's way down the line that starts misbehaving, that's not responding very quickly, that adds up. I mean, that propagates all the way up to the front end. So at each level, you know, there should be an expectation about you know, what the, the response time for the next level of service down should be. And in that way, you don't, uh, you know, you don't queue up a bunch of requests that uh, are potentially never going to finish and just, and, and just toss your whole system. All right, so. And internally, it doesn't take long for someone to find when you've done this, when you've created a dependency on an external service without Hystrix around it. Uh, it'll bubble up to someone really quickly, and they will come find you and let you know. Sorry, you, you probably should wrap that. So very commonly used. Uh, I guess I need to provide a. Uh... Once again in my life, I thought it was the computer's fault and it was mine. Yeah. I don't know how many times I have to relive that moment again. Um, we're going to run Rex. It's worth pointing out if you haven't seen the membership service that's running in the background right now, we've just injected some uh, arbitrary latency. It's on a standard deviation, so some requests will take longer than others. Some requests will arbitrarily fail, about 2%. We'll just return a 500 just so we can demo some of this. I'm also starting another sample application that's available in the repository, and it's just, just stupid simple, uh, is the Hystrix dashboard. So uh, what we've done with the Hystrix command is this application is now uh, collecting up information about every Hystrix command that's invoked, uh, and it's making it available as a stream. Uh, the Hystrix dashboard we're going to use to uh, connect to that stream. Whoops. So here we're at the, the, the Hystrix dashboard uh, page, and we'll go to localhost 8001, which is where our recommendation service is running, and we'll just say hystrix.stream. And then we're going to start abusing it with JMeter. And what you see here is as the abuse starts, and this isn't necessarily a good uh, uh, Hystrix example, but you see that when the latency gets too large and the requests start failing, the circuit will temporarily open. Um, but you know, for the most part, it's closed. And what you really want to do is find a threshold where, uh, where your circuit is generally closed unless there's some exception condition handle happening. In this case, the circuit is opening because of that timeout interval that we, that we specified just to show you that 
um, that it opens and closes, that um, responses are still coming through, uh, recommendations, uh, and whenever you see it open, you're gonna be watching Hook and Sandlot for the rest of the weekend, so. If we saw this behavior in production, it'd be indicative of some poorly tuned Hystrix settings. It so would. your latency is not in line with your expected uh, timeout settings. So we actually track this case and find them, help people retune those, those uh, configurations. There's one other thing we think it's important to know about Hystrix, and that's that fundamentally it's, it's executing by default anyway, it's executing the contents of any Hystrix command inside of a thread pool. Um, which means if you've got any code in there that depends on thread locals or you've got like an app transactional attribute, things start going sideways pretty quick. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what that would, would, would look like. Uh, we're gonna use an existing uh, quest context holder dot current request attributes. Thank you, Taylor, for your spring trivia. Um, he if, happens to know that that uses a thread local. Yes. Um, if, if you're not familiar, it's just gonna pull any information from the current request bound to the thread. So we like to use this in the data layer to grab things like request params that say page size. I don't wanna pass page size all the way through my application, so here's a convenient way to get access to it. Right up until you wrap it in Hystrix. Yeah, and this should normally be fine. Getting the current request attributes is a natural thing to want to do. But, actually there should be one right there. But you'll see that this exception got thrown. An exception was uh, no thread bound for, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can see right here that in the stack trace that Hystrix was involved in, in uh, preventing this uh, thread local from functioning correctly. Um, so there is, there is a, a workaround of sorts, but it has, a, uh, it has some ramifications. Uh, in this case, we can say execution.isolation. Um, strategy. And we want its value to be semaphore. Basically, it means that the, the, the it's just gonna lock here in this, in this body rather than farming off this work to a thread pool that operates outside of it, um, which means this request will function now. Transactional will function correctly. But uh, if, for example, this membership service was taking an extremely long time to run, that thread that's running that request is now blocked yes. until that uh, request returns. So there's a trade-off here. Uh, if you want to use Hystrix and transactional or Hystrix and thread local type things together, um, you have to accept you know, uh, potentially hung threads. Um, it, it's, it's something we don't uh, really have a, a workaround for at this point. Yet, but we're definitely, once, once we discovered it and noticed it was a problem, it's something we're gonna look at just building a, a bridge for the uh, inheritable thread local from Spring, which most everything uses. So. It's an implementation that hasn't been solved yet, but something to be aware of if you're currently using this. All right, so we'll take this out. Are there any questions about Hystrix? Couldn't hear it. Sorry. Sorry. Can you just try speaking up a little bit? I mean, that, that's in totally up to your application logic. So if he's asking for chain dependency services, how do we, uh, how does the service at the front end decide what the fallback should be for something way further down? Uh, the simple and easy answer is it just tries its best. So depending on what your service is, if you're a recommendation service, fallback is easy. There's not much pain there. 
if you're in the payment space, you know, uh, and you have a service that's responsible for returning price, no, there, there is no fallback. You just, you just throw an exception. Historic still has value in blocking these, those long running stuck threads so that you don't waste time calling my broken service, but there certainly isn't a, a reasonable fallback. There's a more complicated answer that uh, we're not gonna touch on completely today, but I can tell you is coming, and that is um, deep tagging of the requests so you can know where something came from, where it failed. That way, when the fallback comes up to the, the top level service, it can know the difference between a failure at something in the middle tier versus something in the deeper levels or deeper and deeper. So you can choose, oh, the, the billing service is down, there's no point showing you this page, let me render something different. So that's, that's a project called SALP and FIT, and there's, there's two or three different internal projects related to that exact thing that we expect to be open sourcing sometime next year. I will mention one other pattern, and I don't, and I say this with some reservation, but um, internally at Netflix, our clients are not always, our service clients are not always as thin as you might imagine. So rather than executing REST requests directly to the service, like you see here, oftentimes a service is accompanied by a client library, and that client library will sometimes provide the Hystrix commands and fallbacks and so forth. So basically the same team that's you know providing the, the service can also provide some of the fallback strategies. Yeah. So I'll show you uh, one of the tools today at the end of this talk, uh, Atlas. Uh, it's it's our operational tool and Hystrix definitely goes there. Uh, we still have this dashboard to consume it a little more visually, but for real ops uh, stuff and monitoring, we, we consume it out of Atlas. And we are gonna skip Turbine today. We were gonna demo that, but Turbine allows you to aggregate several services, history streams into one, and then, uh, then you can basically display a combined dashboard as well. So there, there's also that option out there for you. Uh, it still exists, it still runs. I can say I've maybe gone to it once or twice in three years of being at Netflix. It's, it's more useful probably to everyone here who's just getting started, doesn't have the complex backend like Atlas, and just wants to keep track, you know, maybe you only have a few hundred services. But you can see from the UI, it, it doesn't scale well to the tens of thousands. You need something a little more fine-grained, a little more tunable. So it, we outgrew it, essentially. Yes. So, um, given that I might be uh, with multiple instances talking to other apps with multiple instances, can you talk a little bit more on how Hystrix uh, kind of is being deal with the situation that only I'm only experiencing a failure on one side of that, on one instance? So, how does Hystrix play a role in failures and, and load balancing of, of REST calls. So we mentioned uh, Ribbon has different uh, load balancing strategies. One of them is Hystrix aware. So it is aware of the fact that I am calling a downstream service that is having a problem. It has a Hystrix circuit breaker that is open. And what it will do is we'll just not send traffic to that node. Hopefully it's not all of the nodes. So if it's an isolated problem, your circuit breaker is open in one availability zone then Ribbon will shift all of that traffic to one of the other zones that are healthier. There, there's, a, there's a great, like, um, I, I don't think it's apocryphal, I think it's a true story, uh, about um, the Super Bowl. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're operating in a realm that's AWS, we've got auto-scaling groups, we're auto-scaling up, we're auto-scaling down, you know, trying to be efficient about resources and so forth. And then the Super Bowl starts, and everybody leaves. Netflix, like, everybody stops watching Netflix because they're watching the Super Bowl. And so our ASGs are looking around and going, hey, you know, I guess we don't have any more traffic. We're going to start scaling ourselves down. And then halftime hits. And this, you know, like most halftime shows, it's, it's horrible. And, uh, and everybody comes back to Netflix and starts watching Netflix again at halftime. And so they call it the thundering herd. You know, we just get slammed with a, with a sudden influx of traffic. Um, this is where, you know, circuit breakers might start opening because uh, timeouts aren't meant anymore. Um, but this illustrates that a lot of times circuit breakers are being open for some temporary condition. 
like in this case, our ASGs are now rapidly trying to scale themselves up. And once it's, once it's back, you know, like once we've scaled back up again, uh, those circuit breakers are going to start closing again, and things are going to heal themselves. If we didn't have the, the Hystrix circuit, you know, this cert, we would never recover um, because all those requests would have backed up and, and we would have gone nowhere. Especially when you get into things like retry policies, which is a default configuration of ribbon. You know, I call a service, it fails. Well, let me just call five more times and see. I might get lucky. Uh, <laughs> When we have an issue of thundering herd, when services are legitimately down, that just makes the situation worse. We already can't scale up the demand, and the demand just increased five-fold because of our retry strategy. So that's really the sweet spot for Hystrix, is just cutting that off, letting the services kind of settle down, just stopping the traffic from the source, and then you can scale up. As things start to look healthy again, Hyst Hystrix will let one request through. If it's still bad, keep the rest away. If it starts to look good, start opening the gates, let more people come through. Yeah, I've, I've heard that before, uh, you know, Hystrix was really fully there. Um, we had a lot of, like, if Super Bowl <laughs> type checks in the code, <laughs> do X, because <laughs> uh, it got bad enough. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, metrics. Sure. Metrics. So, I mean, we've talked about a few things. I, I pointed out some, some Hystrix timings that they may not be tuned very well. Um, when you go to this microservice architecture and we start talking about tens or hundreds of services of one application type talking to just as many of a different application type, talking to just as many, and you start getting to a point where every public method on an API might as well be its own new microservice, you really start to lose track of what's going on. So metrics becomes critical to that kind of thing. It's, it's a good architecture to have. There are a lot of benefits to it, but you have to be prepared for that. So what we're gonna show today is the metrics library that we primarily use internally. Um, it's called Spectator, uh, if that's confusing because you know a library called Servo, which is also the Netflix uh, metrics library. Yeah, Spectator wraps Servo uh, in just a cleaner, more dependency injection friendly, test friendly API. So Spring Cloud currently uses Servo, that is an incoming pull request, to just flip it over to, to Spectator and clean up a few nasty bits along the way. So we're just gonna go ahead and add that dependency. So spectator support, while he's adding his dependency, spectator support is being provided by the, the contrib library right now, just to be yes. clear. Uh, so there's an auto configuration on the presence of certain classes from spectator and so forth, so. Um, like I said, we expect this will be fully integrated into Spring Cloud before too long. There's actually a little family of dependencies because we didn't get around to making a starter yet, but naturally you would have a Spring Boot Spectator Starter or Spring Cloud Spectator Starter. So we're gonna pull those dependencies in and we're gonna talk a little bit while that's going about how Spectator is, is structured versus how the existing Spring Boot uh, metrics library is or, or something else you might be using. So this is primarily a tag-driven dimensional metrics API. So if you're familiar with Graphite or something similar, a metric is a name, it's a string. Um, if you want to pull dimensions out of it, it usually involves parsing that string, something like rest dot service uh, or URL dot 200, that's this rest call to this service was successful. And there's another one for failure and another one for uh, 404. So those parsing rules get a little complicated, right? Everyone has to be on the same page, everyone has to follow the same pattern. Uh, it works, it's just not discoverable. So instead of that, we've opted for more tag-driven uh, architecture. And let's see, hopefully this is there. So just to show an example, I'm going to pull in, actually I need an auto wire. Spectator registry. Again, by that uh, Netflix contribs library. This is just going to be created automatically when spectators on your class path. There's nothing you need to do. 
So we can just log a simple metric, say let's do a count of mm, recommendations, and let's start tagging it. Success, false. Okay. That's it. Uh, you can put as many tags as you want on that, uh, as far out as you, as you can handle. Um, it's perfectly fine. There's some caveats, some things you don't want to put as tags, say maybe a customer ID or username, or those, those will blow up very quickly, and, and we'll mention why that's important to know shortly, but just keep that in mind. You should be careful with what you tag. So we'll say that is true. And if I haven't skipped anything, I should be able to run this. Yep, stop. Yeah. Stop. And there's one piece of housekeeping that I, of course, forgot. This is, again, why we're uh, putting this out uh, before we do an actual pull request. There are some things that just conflict. So this does not play nicely currently with the existing uh, Spring Cloud servo integrations. It's something we're aware of and going to tweak. kick off my J meter. Let's get some traffic going. And let's go over to the Spring Boot metrics actuator. So we can see a bunch of default st uh, statistics that we've been added, that have been added by our contribs uh, library. But just let's find the, oh, I apologize. I did miss one thing. I have registered a counter. I have not actually incremented the counter. <laughs> that is pretty useless. <laughs> I think you did that earlier today. I too, did. That, that is a common thing. It's, it's a nice API, but it does leave some room for error. So while he's searching for that one, we've made kind of a best effort here at mapping the tag-based um, metric to uh, a quote-unquote hierarchical name. Uh, basically, it's just the rest of the metric name followed by a set of parentheses and like a set of arguments that have all the tags in it. And we've sorted the tags for you and so forth so they appear in a reasonable order. But um, in general, trying to take a uh, hierarchical metric name and mapping it to a tag name means you need to know the specifics about that domain, you know, the speci exactly how the, the pieces of that hierarchy are, uh, are uh, structured. So there's no generic hierarchical to tag-based mapping that, that you can imagine, unfortunately. Maybe experiencing bad demo luck for some reason. It's very odd that uh, this one metric would fire and not the rest. Oh, because I foolishly went to the wrong service. There we go. Recommendations, find me, yes. Success, true, success, false. And do we have traffic? No, we do not have traffic. There we go. So we are getting about, this is a normalized rate per second of this metric. So for the success false condition, the fallback, we are getting about 84 failures per second. Uh, for the good condition, we're getting about three per second. 
So we're off and running, we're gathering metrics. Um, this shouldn't look too unfamiliar if you've used any other metrics library. This is the one we choose because it plays nicely with our back end. So uh, just to see what other metrics we've captured out of the box, um, first off would be every single request mapping. So we've just created a spectator auto configuration. If you have the registry on the class path, we'll build that for you as you've seen. Um, if you are a web application, we'll build an interceptor for you. And that's gonna just catch every request and tag a few common things. What was the method of the request? What was the URI template variable, or the URI template that was used? So we're gonna take the, any variables and substitute them. You won't get the customer ID, so no metrics explosions. Uh, you'll just get dash customer ID dash. I'm uh, gonna grab the handler names, so the method names in MVC. Uh, who called you, if you have a notion or a custom header that determines who called you. This is just property driven, you can go ahead and set that. Uh, if an exception was thrown, what was the type of the exception and what was the response code status? So these are the things we needed internally. We just finally shipped it out to the rest of the world because these are the common everyday we always wanna know. And you'll see I registered this a little bit differently. I used what's called a, a bucket timer. So in addition to just recording the counts of executions of this, this will record the time of execution, and then add some special tags, and those tags are the buckets. So it'll break, in the, uh, break the tags up into five groups by default, and that's triggered by this max age. So if we go back and look at our metrics, you can see I have status 200, Client abort exception. Oh, I'm sorry. How's that? There we go. Yeah. We have the count bucketed in one second, bucketed in two seconds, bucketed in five seconds, rate per second. So you can see we're quickly just ramping up the amount of data collection we're getting to. We've got lots of good details, but we're still not quite ready to put it together yet. Um, just to show some of the other things, we have the exact same thing for any REST template. Uh, we had to do a little magic to get the actual input, the URL template, so that when you did a REST call, we could figure out, you know, this is the customer ID, this is the username. So we have a little aspect wrapping that. And we're going to capture much the same data. Method, URL template, status, client name, in this case membership, um, and then the actual time of it. And we've taken this and we've done it as well for spring integration which I'll just show, I think that's running on host. So new in spring integration 4.2, uh, there's a great new metrics extraction and we just couldn't let that slide so we immediately pulled that in and configured the same thing. So you will have the, uh, the name be spring integration and we'll have the uh, the type of the thing it was, be it a, a transformer, a channel, a pullable channel, a queue channel, and then from each of those, the metrics that went through. So Netflix and trips, we're gonna, we're gonna publish all of this data for you. You don't have to figure it out. Metrics for free on probably the most common things that you deal with. Uh, things to do are queue handlers, uh, message mapping endpoints. Those are all gonna be added in the future because we need them internally. So. That's Spectator. Any questions about Spectator itself? Sure. Yes.
that's fair. Fair enough. So he was just correct, correctly pointing out that um, the, the notion of tags here is, is not quite the same as, as what, what it might be in something like OpenTSDB, another framework that kind of fits in the same role. So these are truly dimensions. They're fully fleshed out. For each one, we're going to take all of this data and ship it to our back end, where in other frameworks, that stuff is, is kind of collapsed down. So things like customer ID are dangerous because of the high cardinality, because it's just it, too much data to ship to the back end. If you want to use, what's Coda that? Hail. So we are taking the, the Coda Hail metrics and stuffing them into Spectator and they're getting yeah. shipped. Um, but like I said, I mean, in general, taking a hierarchical name and transforming it into a tag based name has its limits. Yeah. Um, so we're doing that to an extent. It, it remains to be seen how useful that actually is. But if you publish something under the Spring Boot metrics framework via Coda Hail or something else you've come up with, we'll go and, you know, there's an aggregator interface. We'll take those and publish them to Spectator um, for what use it, it may be. We'll, we'll try to see. I think we'll take one more question. We got to show Atlas with the little time remaining we've got. Not from Spectator itself, because Spectator is just an API to gather data, keep it up in memory, and then do something with. The do something with is what we haven't gotten to yet. But this, this will just store in memory, purge over time, and if no one uses it, it just goes away. But it, this is the full data. So if you do some really crazy dimensions or crazy amount of metrics, it may be a problem. It's not something we've seen, but it's certainly something you could set up for yourself. Let's move on to Atlas. So. Now we need to talk about the back end. So we'll do. Just want to make sure it's running. So what we have is a service called Atlas. Um, please check it out in GitHub. Uh, the documentation I'm going to keep here because it is helpful to show some of this stuff. But we're running it in a local configuration in memory. Um, there's a start atlas script in the root of our projects. Just feel free to, to give it a run and, and watch it go for you. Um, and what we need is one final plugin. It's a membership. Oh, there was a reason I went to membership. So this dependency is the, uh, the plugin that takes uh, data collected by, um, by Spectator and ships it to the back end. Um, so the aggregation you were talking about is what is going to happen on the back end after each of the separate instances ship all their data to the back end. And again, Netflix Contrib is going to configure it, set it up for you. Uh, there are still some properties you need to have, just like with Eureka. And that property is the location of the Atlas URI, where to publish it to. And the same rules apply as with Eureka. We tend to start with Route 53 and maybe do some, some more load balancing beyond that. Uh, Route 53 fits perfectly for something like Atlas. So being it just a tool and it's not as important to us. recommendations now that we have the dependency.
So if I look at my atlas, it's collected some data from a couple of apps, membership, and now recommendations is showing as well. So this is the tag API. We can start discovering things about our dimensions that are, that are in Atlas from here. So I've shown app name. Maybe I want to see bucket, what buckets exist. Uh, maybe I want to see URI. Here are the URIs that have been collected by Spectator and published out to Atlas. So we have some good access to this data here. Uh, so now we have the information, but what's the purpose of all this? And that really is to put it somewhere that is visual. So let's go ahead and run a different uh, URL. So this is V1 graph query parameter is name comma arrest equal comma average. That didn't work well. So there we go. We have some data coming from Atlas already, just graphing what we have on the back end. So this is this uh, reverse Polish notation. This is the, the way they've decided to implement all of the Atlas queries. It's a little daunting at first look, but it's actually very nice to have all of this wrapped in the URL pattern so that you can forward these links as image links and they just go, they fit anywhere. You can go forward, backwards, everything is nice and, and workable. So, okay, fine, we have a, a line on a graph. Let's, uh, let's go a little bit deeper. So I'm looking at the rest statistic. We were seeing spring, uh, spring Netflix contrib publish. I'm gonna get the count. Hopefully I typed that right. is just being a little bit slow for us. My poor machine. Yeah, this instance has had about enough request timeout. That's not good. I'm just gonna go ahead and give Atlas a little bounce because I think it's had enough. It's unfortunate we're gonna lose those historical metrics we've been gaining so far, but that's okay. Ah, the demo curse. Indeed. We can have to restart the services. Let me just see if... Uh, This works. So one of the things we did just building on that API uh, library is we just collapsed a few examples into this dashboard.html just so that you can see. It's um, cut off. How is it? I can't shift it either. You can unzoom it though, right? So there we go. There we go. So as these metrics build up over time, we're going to see. Um, this one is just looking at the rate by time bucket. So we have about 100 per second running off of our J meter. The vast majority of them are in the one second bucket. Very small minority is in the two second bucket, even fewer in the five second bucket. So that's that normal distribution we talked about for our random latency. But you can sort of get a grasp on how we can just pull this stuff together and, and turn it into something that's a little more consumable, something that's visual you can get your hands on very quickly. This dashboard took me very little time to get through. So here's the same thing, rate by bucket and handler name. So let's just put those two dimensions together. Let's see if there's one method that's performing a little better, a little worse than the other. Uh, we actually have team, uh, the reliability engineering team. They mostly focus on just playing with this, discovering metrics, tweaking them by different dimensions and trying to find outliers, trying to find uh, which node on a farm is going badly, which API is, is behaving poorly, and even at what times of the day those things start to go off. So another one is the percentage of response codes. 
As you can see, we had about a 2% failure, or you might be able to see the tiny sliver of red up at the top. So just a different way to visualize this stuff uh, as a stacked out of 100, 98% was fine, right up until the very end when we did a little server bounce. Uh, max time by, by handler name. So you get the idea. This is where we can do some of the alerting stuff. So if you refer to the Atlas uh, examples, there are just so many of these. Uh, examples on putting multiple lines on a, on a image, putting um, prediction lines on an image, taking something that looks like this, very sharp and choppy, and using an algorithm, double exponential smoothing, to just do a best fit curve. That way you can see roughly where you are. There are uh, time shift capabilities built in. So you can shift back and show me a line that is this exact metric from last week or last month. That way I can compare the two. Um, it's just a really, really powerful back end, and it's, it's what actually drives a lot of our ability to do red-black pushes, to, do a, to be a fail-fast company, to roll billing out and, oh, wow, there's, it's broken. We need, to, we need to hurry up and react to it. So this, this is really one of the core pieces of our, our infrastructure that it's a shame we haven't seen more of in open source, and we want to really start pushing it. So this is a consumable piece. It's something you can set up with a little care. And it's something that we think Spring Cloud could use some more of. So we definitely want to figure out how we can push this forward and make this consumable for everyone. Great. I'll take questions on that. I'll connect to the VPN. So any questions on Atlas? Atlas? Um, uh, he was asking when was the Atlas project started. So that was probably maybe three or four years ago. It's, it's, been, it's been internal for a while, incubating. I think it's been open sourced for over a year now. Um, what's not open sourced is the UI we have internally, which we're gonna show a little bit of, if John can connect to the VPN, um, just so you can get a real feel of what this looks like in, inside of Netflix. But uh, it's, it's been a long time coming. And we, we talk about Eureka, but this is really the thing that Separate from Eureka is probably the biggest piece of our infrastructure that really matters to us day to day. It really enables DevOps. We did. That again is still not open sourced yet, unfortunately. Uh, but everything in those graph APIs are just JSON blobs. If you, if you ask for it not as a PNG but as a, a JSON, you'll get the data points. So we have just a really simple uh, service that trolls those. You inform the service what to watch for, give it a threshold, and if this JSON value ever goes above, send an email, send a pager duty. Uh, it's, all, it's all integrated very nicely. So it's, it's something that has been on the deck for a while. We need to get out into the, into the rest of the world because it's so good and it really makes our lives easier. While Taylor's bringing up his too, I mean, uh, about the alerting thing, you know, there's, Atlas has a feature for exponential smoothing of a, of a particular curve as well. And so you can, uh, you can kind of eliminate those spurious spikes. And then once we, we often base alerting uh, triggers off of the, the exponentially smooth curve. Um, so you set a certain threshold and somebody gets paged if, if, if something weird goes on. So as I said, we've been working on this stuff internally, the spring integration of this. This is a dashboard we built and it's using all the same metrics we were showing today. So, you know, find me the counts of all the MVC requests and their latencies, stack them by bucket, and just show them on a, do on a dashboard that makes sense, makes it easily consumable. So you can see our request rate, and this is for the, uh, one of the core billing systems. 600 per second is the average rate. You can see this black line is the rate from last week. That's our time shift, where you can see these little interesting dips, right? Last week, uh, on this day, there was a bug in prod. Somewhere above us, so Hystrix kicked in, our traffic went down. We were alerted, it wasn't our fault, but we knew. You know, we got on the issue right away, identified who was having the trouble and let them help them fix it. Uh, other interesting patterns you might notice is this little spike here, it, it coincides with a spike on the black history line as well. What that tells me is actually somebody has a job somewhere at Netflix and is hammering our service on a given time the same day every day or every week. We don't know why yet. That's a very common thing. <laughs> I'd say a lot of my day is responding to these alerts and graphs and figuring out who is responsible. So you saw that caller metric. That is critical here. When I break this out by caller and I know 
ah, it's that service. That's the one I need to go track down and talk to. It's just incredibly helpful. And then having these all together with the latencies, with the total exceptions logged, all the way down to CPU, heap stats, uh, TCP, network stats, putting them all on one dashboard just really drives home you know, when you're having an issue, where is it? When I see a drop in connections and I see a spike in TCP failures, I know it's not probably not my code, it's probably something on Amazon. If I see latencies go up and exceptions go down, it, it just becomes so clear to us what is, what is going on. Um, it, in fact, this is so useful, we've actually built a language internally around it. It's a, it's a closure-based DSL to build some of those URLs because as I said, it's a little bit daunting, but again, that's something we wanna, we wanna put out into the community so that we can get some, some traction on this framework. This is also a great like behavioral modification tool. So, you know, like you mentioned before, if you if you set an alert on, you know, a particular service, anytime it doesn't return an HTTP 200 uh, over a certain uh, small threshold, somebody's going to get paged. Uh, you pretty quickly find that that service starts returning 200s more often. <laughs> so, um, it can be really useful for things like that. It's very common to create alerts for other teams that uh, cause issues for you. Any final questions? I know we're kind of wrapping up on time here. All right, well thank you so much for coming, appreciate it.